Namaskar. As you all are aware, presented here are the lectures of Swami Gokulananda Ji Maharaj on how to overcome mental tension. So far we have done two topics, stress and the body-mind complex, role of higher values in resolving mental tension. We are continuing with the chapter, some views about mental tension. In the previous lecture, Swami Gokulananji Maharaj talked about Samanvaya Yoga, which is the combination of Raja Yoga, Jnana Yoga, Karma Yoga and Bhakti Yoga. He continues, Unless we adopt these attitudes, we are sure to react adversely to whatever incident takes place. For instance, if a subordinate insults a person, he will reply in kind unless he keeps in mind the innate divinity of the subordinate which makes them equal on the spiritual plane. This is possible only through rigorous self-analysis which is called Gyan Yoga. To be a successful practitioner of Samanvaya Yoga, we have to constantly check whether we are exhibiting the right attitudes of the mind. Maharaj says, In our earlier discussions, we have given much importance to the causes of mental tension. To cope with it, we do variety of things. But much of it is pretty superficial. For example, medical treatment is often given to us based on certain external symptoms, but it does little for the underlying deep-seated malady which is not manifest in any visible form. Suppose a person is suffering from acute mental tension and is terribly upset. If he has a habit of smoking, he would like to smoke his tension away. Others might take intoxicants, aspirins or sleeping tablets, watch television or go for an outing or on a vacation. Each practices relaxation in his or her own way but they have very little success in overcoming the actual cause of the tension or stress. Let me repeat that nervous tension is a kind of psychosomatic disease. There is a general agreement that a great number of our diseases are psychosomatic, both physical and mental, and they influence our thoughts, our prejudices, our beliefs, our environment, and also how we react to different situations. Of course, this does not mean that symptoms of various diseases such as ulcer or headache are all imaginary, certainly not. Suppose someone has a headache and I say, why are you taking a painkiller? The headache is imaginary. Such a comment is unkind because if a person is suffering, we must believe him and not think his pain is imaginary. The point is, why does the headache occur? There must be a cause. Diseases of various kinds are real enough. To designate them as psychosomatic is to acknowledge that the major cause of a disease is a person's emotional stress. We all suffer from emotional stress or tension. In other words, the way we react to our environment results in some kind of internal psychological changes which evolve into some kind of diseases of the body. The pattern for all these diseases, of course, is different. Suppose a person is a victim of anger. Instead of giving expression to his anger, he suppresses it. This may develop into mental depression or migraine, headaches. Even though the development of a specific psychosomatic disease is unique in each individual, the underlying principle is the same. We have to carefully see what this underlying principle is. We allow ourselves to be swayed by different kinds of emotions and as a result of the emotional stress, we subject ourselves to psychological stress. In this way, emotional stress leads to an eventual breakdown of our organic system. A classic example is ulcer. Obviously, it has a connection with nervous tension. One of the characteristics typically associated with ulcer is a tendency to exaggerate worries 
or find it difficult to express feelings of anger and fear openly. The other day, a person came to me and said, Swamiji, I am seized with fear, fear of cancer. I don't know why this fear has possessed me. I know in my saner moments that I am all right. Still, the thought that I have cancer does not leave me. It has no remedy. Such a situation is often encountered when we have a high degree of competitiveness or a tendency to exaggerate worries. Poor dietary habits such as eating when one is tense or eating quickly may result in what the doctors term as an overly acidic condition in the gastrointestinal tract which ultimately results in ulcer. This malady could have been prevented had it been attended to earlier by taking into account the patient's emotional stress. The tension under which he, she had been laboring should have been handled with care. Then perhaps we could have prevented the ulcer. What is thus needed is to pay careful attention to a patient's personal history from which we can invariably trace the origin of psychosomatic diseases back to patterns of emotional pressures. This instance of ulcer is just one among the variety of psychosomatic diseases. Many more examples can be given, all of which are directly related to some kind of nervous stress or tension. Even common diseases like headache, which I have already mentioned in addition to cold, backache, chest pain are all psychosomatic. It is difficult to predict accurately why some organs are more affected by the stress than others. But one thing which modern medical science has made effectively clear is that nervous tension or stress is at the root of all psychosomatic diseases regardless of the organic system involved. Modern research is also beginning to reveal a direct relationship between nervous tension and what is called in medical parlance CVD, cardiovascular diseases. According to the latest data, strokes and heart diseases are the greatest killers and nervous tension is most often the basis of these diseases. In this area, the relationship between nervous tension and CVD is clearly described by Dr. Mayer Friedman and Dr. Ray Rosenman in their monumental work entitled Type A Behavior and Your Fear. In it, they point out that there are certain personalities called Type A personalities who are very much prone to cardiovascular diseases. And there is another type known as type B who are not so prone to it as type A is. Regarding the characteristics of a type A personality, we can say that such a person is almost always under the constant pressure to perform. They have their minds filled with the idea that they have to do the job in hand because no one else will be able to do it. This is the reason why such a person is engulfed by pressure. A person who is under constant pressure to perform is in a hurry to do everything. Such a person is also characterized by impatience, driving ambition, endless desire for competition, aggressiveness and quite often hostile too. This person seems to be always short of time and the 24 hours of a day seem insufficient. There is a feeling that they have too much to do. But in this process of overcrowding themselves, they have created psychological problems and health hazards for themselves. On the other hand, type B personalities appear to be calm and relaxed and free from the desperate urgency of fighting against time. Such persons do not harbor much anger. They know when to relax and enjoy themselves. Statistically, such a personality does not have much danger of contacting CVD. 
It is often thought by type A personalities that they can do more than the type B ones who do not get excited and do their work in a calm and quiet manner. But the fact is that the former do not achieve more than the latter for the simple reason that they dissipate much energy in useless pressure. The type B persons work silently and in a relaxed manner which produces effective results. The busy executive is a classic example of type A personality. He is a person who is engaged in a struggle to obtain optimum conditions or quick results in the shortest possible time. He feels that the work has to be done quickly and often against opposition. He is often under pressure from within to obtain more and more in less time. In a word, type A personalities feel that they have to be efficient. They have to prove their efficiency to others. If the target of a particular task is five years, they drive themselves hard to finish it a few months ahead of time in order to get credit from the boss. Since the trait of aggressiveness is strong in such personalities and also unlimited ambition is there, such people are often the ones who are work-oriented. Even when left to himself, he does not have the time to do a little self-analysis. If he is asked to stop working, he will go mad. Such a person is often too explicit in speech and has little control over what he is going to say. He focuses his attention exclusively on his work and fails to notice or enjoy the beautiful things in life. We can describe him as permanently tense. While comparing the type A and B, Dr. Friedman and Dr. Rosenman gave the following chart attributing some typical traits to each of the two types. In the first case, that is type A, we find 1. Hurried speech 2. Constant rapid movement in eating 3. Open impatience 4. Chronic sense of time urgency 5. Thinking and performing several things at once 6. An active attempt to dominate the conversation, to determine the topics, to remain preoccupied with one's thoughts when others are talking. 7. Vague sense of guilt during periods of relaxation when doing nothing. 8. Excessive concern with getting things worth having. No time to become that which is worth being. That means they are over-concerned about how to get things done but do not reflect upon the fact of how they can become better human beings. Their sole concern is to get the work executed. No compassion for other types of people. 9. They have certain typical gestures, physical nervous gestures such as clenching fists, grinding teeth, etc. These are the 9 characteristics of a personality who is prone to heart diseases. As against this is the type B personality who has following characteristics. 1. No sense of time urgency. 2. No felt need to discuss or display one's achievements and accomplishments unless situation demands it. That means, if somebody wants it, of course, type B people will speak about their achievements, but they do not believe in parading their achievements or boasting about them. 3. A belief that play exists for fun and relaxation, not to exhibit superiority. 4. An ability to relax without guilt. And 5. One who can work without any kind of excitement, without any agitation. Though type A personalities can claim that they are the real karma yogis, yet in the light of the characteristics just enumerated, we can say that a real karm yogi will do everything in a calm and collected manner. As Swami Vivekananda said, the calmer we are, 
the less disturbed our nerves will be. The more shall we love and the better our work will be. Hope you have enjoyed this very interesting lecture. In the next episode, Maharaj will speak on stress and the dynamics of success. Till then, stay tuned to Devakshar. Subscribe to our channel, share and like the videos. Thank you so much for being with us.